here today was Andrea Boisier, veteran of international film distribution, focused primarily in Eastern Europe and uh, former Soviet Union countries, correct? Correct. Yes, hi. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Great honor. Yeah, well, no, the pleasure is mine. So I realized today something interesting. We've been friends for a long time, but, um, and I know obviously what you do, but I don't know as much about what you do. It's so weird. I mean, I looked you up, obviously, and it was funny to look up my own friend. <laughs> you know what I mean? You were snooping on me. I was. I was totally... Um... I hope you'll give me a chance to defend myself on whatever you found out there. <laughs> I'm sure... I'm sure you'll all go through Lana first. <laughs> I, I'm one of the very few that uh, in this business that doesn't do Facebook, uh, Twitter, or any social media, so I may not be as... Uh, Revealed as other people would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, Lana is not your wife, Lana. Um, is not really that active either. No, oh, she's um, much more active than me. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. No wonder. I have to do all the social media because, you know. I fully appreciate its functionality. My, my concern is if I started it, I probably would spin into a vortex. Oh, yeah. I'd never totally come back is. from. Yeah, it totally so. is a vortex. Yeah. Between business and having a little baby boy, my, my time is fully co-opted, so I don't have much oh time. Oh my god, this baby boy is so cute. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, let's talk about you and um, your career. So maybe tell us a little bit about the several companies that you have, and, um, and then we'll talk how you began. Well, maybe I'll talk about how it began. Okay. Start from the beginning. Sure. I was a journalist coming out of university back in New York. Mm -hmm. And my dream was to go cover revolutions. Mm -hmm. So imagine when the managing editor of Newsweek said to me, don't waste your time getting a job here. Get a one-way ticket to Salvador. The war's about to break out there. Mm -hmm. You're, I'm half Cuban, so I speak Spanish. He said, you'll make your way five times faster than the normal pencil pusher at a desk. My eyes were bulging. I said, great. I booked a ticket for that next Monday. And over the weekend, I... Um, blew out my ankle in a squash tournament and oh had to get God. surgery and I literally missed the boat. Oh my God. And the whole press corps by that summer went from Salvador down to Argentina because there was this big war called the Falkland War where England was fighting Argentina over a sheep colony. But from a press point of view, the one-two punch was fantastic. So I was thoroughly depressed at having missed a major life opportunity, mm -hmm. two opportunities. And while I was convalescing in New York, I was introduced to a gentleman called Jerry Perenchio, who ran Embassy Pictures, which was a mini studio at the time. And um, they hired me at a whopping $120 a week. <laughs> and I was thrilled out of my mind to have something to do, to take my mind off the boat that I'd missed. And they put me in charge of this Puerto Rican rock group sensation called Menudo. Mm -hmm. Menudo was like the Beatles for Latin America. Oh, wow. And it was a gimmick whereby the kids came in at 11 and they left at age 15. And that way they kept their group fresh. So I was their designated babysitter, manager, tour guide, distributor whenever they came to America because Embassy owned the rights to Minuto for music and for film. Mm -hmm. I was the youngest kid in the company, I'm half Latin, and they said, you take care of them. I knew nothing about music. There was this little guy called Ricky Martin in the group at that time. <laughs> I had no idea who Ricky Martin was, but it's funny in retrospect to see that. Uh, so we distributed their movies, organized their concerts. It was a lot of fun. Six months later, I got transferred to California to do the same thing with Embassy. And six months after that, they sold the company to Coca-Cola, I believe. Mm -hmm. And overnight, I found myself moving into a different job uh, at a company called InterOcean, run by a fantastic man who recently passed away, uh, Arnold Copelson, mm -hmm. and his wife, Anne. They were really mentors to me. And while I'm there, the first film that I sell for them, I was the head of distribution there for them, was um, Salvador by Oliver Stone, it was his oh, first wow. film. And I'm thinking, isn't life poetic? I was supposed to go to Salvador to cover the revolution and I ended up selling a film called Salvador. Yeah. So it was like, not quite what I intended, but Salvador was in my destiny. Aren't you, aren't you happy you're not in business of revolutions anymore? It's kind of a dying One of my place. companies is called Revolutionary Releasing, so I never quite got <laughs> it out of my blood. Okay. But, uh, and after that, Arnold produced Platoon, which won Best Picture of the Year. Mm -hmm. So it was an incredible time to be associated with them. Um, but I had an itch. As great as that experience was, I had an itch to be out on my own at an early age. So I think at 29, 
I, I uh, ventured out and started a company called Ablo Inc. Uh, Ablo is Andre Boissier Licensing Organization. Not terribly original, but when you've run out of names and the printer calls you and says, we need to print the stationery and the business cards like in an hour, what name are you going with? Mm -hmm. That's what I had. And Ablo is basically a consulting company that 30 years later still exists. And we represent what I'd say the, is the, uh, the most high profile theatrical distributors around the world. Uh, companies who want to have a presence in Los Angeles without taking on the expense of a full-on overhead. So we're like their cyber office. Mm -hmm. And we help them recommending projects, tracking scripts, um, reading scripts, analyzing scripts, um, going to screenings, basically keeping our finger on the pulse of anything and everything that could affect their business uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. And we're very fortunate to work with um, really some of the most uh, reputable, exclusive, and wonderful distributors around the world, from in all of Europe to Asia, Latin America. Uh, and that puts us at the intersection of a lot of very helpful information uh, because we're representing a dozen countries. And if it's the right project, the sales agents know that with us they can give immediate coverage to a lot of top distributors. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a service business. And I realized after about 10 years that Service business is important, but you also maybe want to create an asset business. And with that, I started a company called Pasatiempo Pictures, which is was basically Latin American based, where we would buy rights and sell rights. Mm -hmm. And we were very lucky. Our first film was Como Agua para Chocolate, like Water for Chocolate, which was a big sensation. It was the biggest foreign language grossing film in America at the time. Big, big success. What year was that? That probably would have been uh, 1989, mm -hmm. more or less. Mm -hmm. um, and we bought the film and we resold the rights, and that worked out very well. But not as well as if we'd actually kept the rights and distributed them, which we didn't because we didn't have the infrastructural setup. Mm -hmm. But I got a taste of what on-the-ground end-user distribution mm -hmm. was like. Mm -hmm. Ten years later, in 1998, we stepped into our first Eastern European adventure. Mm -hmm. And it was quite an adventure. Back then, uh, I was representing, through Ablo, a couple of distributors in Eastern Europe, primarily Poland and ex Yugoslavia. Uh, everybody perceived Eastern Europe as the Wild West, communist, crazy. I mean, nobody even knew where Bulgaria or Romania were. And I got a call from a dear friend of mine who ran Lakeshore Entertainment, mm -hmm. Peter Rogers, and they had developed a project, a romantic comedy, that they'd sold to Disney for the world. Mm -hmm. And Peter calls me and says, Disney just called me and they want to give us back two territories that they don't know what to do with, Eastern Europe and Russia. Are you interested? I know you represent somebody there. My partner today, uh, Marius Lukomsky, and I have been talking about possibly doing some kind of distribution in Eastern Europe. And how would we go about doing that? Well, it's a funny thing when you put things out to the universe, how the universe responds. Of course. So this call comes in. I say, one second, I call Marius. I said, here's an opportunity. That romantic comedy, by the way, was Runaway Bride oh, with wow. Julia Roberts and Richard Gere, uh -huh. Gary Marshall directing. So you imagine an opportunity to start your business with this. Yeah. They were asking a crazy amount of money, but my partner is kind of crazy in a good way, and we said yes. Mm -hmm. And we bought Eastern Europe, and we bought Russia, and what was very revealing is that Eastern Europe was actually very transparent, and it wasn't chaotic. And it was very capitalist in the way it accounted for revenues and the way it communicated. Mm -hmm. But the outside world thought it had a completely different reputation. So we exploited that misperception, that inefficiency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the film exploded. And we collected the money. And we reinvested it right away in the next film, which I think was Hannibal, the, the sequel to The Silence of the Lambs. Mm -hmm. And soon after that came What Women Want with Mel Gibson, which I was another blockbuster. Oh my God. And right after that came my big fat Greek wedding. Oh my goodness. And here we are in the first two years, we have five blockbusters. I'm thinking, this business is really easy. I mean, this is... <laughs> I've never been to Eastern Europe that whole time. I'm thinking, the more I stay away, the better we do. So right. it was quite an incredible run. And I think we had a five-year head start before anybody else in the territory woke up and competition came to the fore. From a marketing perspective, meaning how we market ourselves to Hollywood, it was fantastic because here we were saying, Instead of selling Poland and Czech and Slovakia and Romania and Hungary and Bulgaria, sell us everything, we'll make one payment, one contract, one delivery, one reporting, 
it's one-stop shopping for you. And the sales agents who had never sold Eastern Europe were thrilled. The producers were thrilled. It, it was it was a win-win for everybody. Mm -hmm. And that jump-started our company because we kept reinvesting everything. Uh, over the years, we had um, a couple of Best Picture winners, uh, Slumdog Millionaire, uh, Crash. Uh, I'm missing a couple more that will come back to me. Uh, and today, the companies have um, output deals with the likes of Lionsgate, Summit, STX, Amblin. So we're very well positioned uh, as a leading independent in the territory. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a very exciting to see that this was born out of nothing except the lucky opportunity mm -hmm. uh, and that we've self-financed the company for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and our main thesis is if having premium content gives you a seat at the table in this big new derby of disruption, if, if having that content gives you a seat at the table, then I think we have a decent seat at the table. Mm -hmm. If that thesis is not right, uh, I might be working for you soon. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> but anyway, today we still have the same companies. Avo representing the distributors, Pasatiempo focused in Latin America, and um, well, Revolution Releasing was the original company for Eastern Europe, and now is known as Unicorn Media Limited. Um, and we, we have three partners, very prominent partners in Eastern Europe that I'm very proud to call extremely close friends and partners. So that is a nutshell of right. what we do. So do you work with independent producers? Well, indirectly, we only work with independent producers right. because they're the ones that are bringing the independent product, but they rarely interface directly with us. They usually work through a sales agent, Correct. of which there might be a couple hundred in the world, mm -hmm. here, UK, mm -hmm. France, mm -hmm. I mean, pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. But the sales agent will represent the producer's interest in terms of selling the film to people like myself. And when I say selling, they're actually pre-selling because 95% of the films that we buy have not been made yet. Why? Because they rely on financing that people like me and others bring, mm -hmm. and they take our contracts and they discount them at the bank, and that becomes part of the collateral bouquet that allows a film to get financed, right. together with equity and gap and what other subsidies might be available. Um, we, we try to get to know a lot of the independent producers, but as, as easy as it, it might sound to deal directly with them, Generally, it's, it makes more sense for them to go through a sales agent because they're not just selling, they're also doing the contracts, they're also servicing the film. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're taking care of a, a myriad of different obligations that a producer probably wouldn't be able to do on his own. So what's the criteria? Let's say, uh, and the reason why I'm asking is because a lot of uh, the viewers are independent producers. And so what's the criteria, for instance, if they would like to go to one of those sales agents and show their product, uh, that they're getting ready to shoot and need in needs of some finances, so on and so forth. What is it that you guys are looking for, generally speaking? Well, the two sets of criteria. One is the criteria I'd be looking at. The other is the criteria that the sales agent would be looking at. Mm -hmm. They're linked because a sales agent, a reputable sales agent, wouldn't present the package to me unless they're satisfied as well. But I'd say first and foremost, a compelling story. Mm -hmm. And that's open to... Um, that's very subjective, what a, a, a compelling story is, but to me it always starts with the story because you can make a bad film from a good script, it's very hard to make a good film from a bad script. Okay. And that, that's obvious. A good story will also usually attract good talent because everybody wants to tell a good story. I mean, part of good storytelling, that's as old as time. Mm -hmm. From the time people sat around the campfires in the caveman's era to today, people want to be entertained. So what's the best story that will attract the best talent? Mm -hmm. And if you have a strong sense that you'll attract the best talent, there's a good chance you'll land the financing for the project as well. Today, uh, there's no shortage of financing. Uh, I think it's actually too much financing, and by that I mean it's allowing films that probably shouldn't be made to get made and take up a lot of shelf space and confuse a consumer and clutter the mm -hmm. ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, this is a very Darwinistic business and, and the best films float to the top and find mm -hmm. their homes. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, there are a lot of films that I, I just don't know how the bottom line makes sense. And maybe there doesn't matter if they make sense, meaning if it's vanity money or tax-driven money um, or ego money, they don't care about the, whether the film makes money or not. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of films that, when I'm saying, that clutter up the space, you know. Right. And, and I'm not saying, look, anybody can make a film and if they can afford it, great. But in terms of 
getting the purest flow of product through the best distribution pipelines, mm -hmm. you know, the, the best projects come to the fore. They can be big, they can be small. I mean, uh, you can have a Hunger Games and you can have a little film like Room from a few years mm -hmm. ago that was made for probably next to nothing and was nominated for several Oscars and won several Oscars. There's room for everything and there should be room for everything. Mm -hmm. But script, talent, and financing. Mm -hmm. So um, you require attachment. Well, when we're pre-buying a film, mm -hmm. Absolutely. First, we have to like the story, mm -hmm. but absolutely, we need to know who the main cast is and who the director is, course, yeah. and who's producing it, mm -hmm. what their track record is, mm -hmm. and those are usually included as essential elements, meaning mm -hmm. that they have to guarantee us that when the film is delivered, it will include that star, that director, and usually that producer. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, we'll also insist on U.S. distribution because we want to know that it's, we're very theatrically oriented. We want to know it's going to get a substantial, traditional U.S. Mm -hmm. theatrical release as opposed to going straight to VOD. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with going straight to VOD, like doing a Netflix deal mm -hmm. or Hulu uh, or Amazon, although they do go out theatrically. But it gives the film a different patina. Mm -hmm. And from the foreigner's point of view, internationally, when the exhibitors see that a film is going straight to Netflix, they'll say, well, why should I put it in my theaters? This is not a theatrical movie. Mm -hmm. It's a straight to VOD movie. Mm -hmm. That's a huge distinction. Mm -hmm. um, I can understand uh, because there's such thing as uh, film that are made, there used to used to be such thing as films made strictly for television. For right? television, for video. Yeah, so people sometimes get confused thinking, well, in a way, Netflix is a television. But it's really not. It's, it's, it's a hybrid. It's confusing yeah. the landscape yeah. very much. Um, yes, there, there's Lifetime movies of the week. Mm -hmm. um, they used to be straight to video movies right. made for video because it yeah. was a huge market. Today, video is pretty much disappeared. Yeah. Uh, Netflix is, is confused the market, not necessarily in a bad way because they're aspiring to be a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, what's happening now, though, is you'll have a $30 million film that was intended and financed and made for theatrical distribution, and Netflix will say, I like that, I want that for my platform so that I can market Netflix in a different optic, and the money they're offering to buy the film will be so compelling that the producer can't turn it down, or the financiers. Mm -hmm. So a theatrical movie will actually end up going to Netflix. That's happened a lot. Mm -hmm. In and of itself, it's not a bad thing, except that internationally, it's going to taint the perception of the film, with rare exception. Roma would be the most recent example. Right, right. But even there, I think Netflix reinvented its own rules to accommodate Roma because they thought that they had something extraordinarily special there. Mm -hmm. And they had participant media, which is a theatrical mm -hmm. financier behind it. They, 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 they couldn't just put this on VOD. They right. deserved a broader audience. And, and that opens up the whole argument of what's the future of the, of the theatrical that windows. That was going to be my next question, your personal perspective on it, because I hear a lot of opinions on there, that. There's a lot of opinions and that. I don't think the jury's out yet. Um, I will tell you that one of our clients, who also happens to be the second biggest exhibitor in the world, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's Cineworld, they, they bought Regal Cinemas a couple of years ago. They have a very strict policy in all of their theaters, whether it's in America, in England, in Europe, Eastern Europe, it's a four-month holdback from mm -hmm. Theatrical, first theatrical exploitation to the next exploitation of any media. Four months. Mm -hmm. That doesn't strike me as a long time, but the people who, who who live by VOD and TVOD would tell you, no, we should be able to get in earlier, and ultimately it should be up to the consumer to decide how they want to see a film, when they want to see it, and where they want to see it. Mm -hmm. um, I personally think that the windows are going to hold for a while longer, mm -hmm. um, because I think there's so much churning of product mm -hmm. that... People are distracted by other opportunities they have with film and outside of film, and they'll wait those four months. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think the cinematic experience um, has a very special place. People like the community, larger than life feeling, being in the it's darkness with other people. Yeah, um, 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 genetical. Uh, one of my first bosses, I was having this conversation 25 years ago, he said, look, you don't have to go to a church or a synagogue or a temple to pray. You can stay home and do that. But why do people go there? Because they want a sense of being part of something larger. Mm -hmm. and, and not to compare you know, faith with movies, but it's a little bit that communal experience is what people want. you know. Mm -hmm. And especially the theaters have made such a, an investment and an effort to make going to the theaters fun and, and hip today. And, and whether it's the VIP salons with the served food and drink, mm -hmm. 
or whether it's the more comfortable chairs or the enhanced technology with the, the screens and then the sound, whatever. I mean, there's a lot of reasons they give the, the consumers to come yeah. to, to, to the theaters. Um, but I, I do understand both sides of the coin. I mean, I think ultimately if, if you came out with a reasonable pricing plan that let people uh, screen films 30 days after at a much higher price point, mm -hmm. um, you'd find an audience for that, you know, because there's the other side of the coin if you're a family with four kids, you know, not have, you know, the price of going to the theater, parking, popcorn, mm -hmm. tickets, maybe the babysitter, it adds up to a very expensive evening. Mm -hmm. Whereas paying, even if you paid $100 to see a film at home, you know, you could have 20 people over and think it was a deal by comparison. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, when you're saying hundred dollars, what do you mean exactly? No, I'm saying if, if even if that if, if 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 everybody got together and they haven't mm -hmm. today, meaning the theatrical exhibitors and the VOD players and the producers and said we're going to offer um, a theatrical movie to consumers on VOD thirty days after the theatrical experience, but they're going to pay a big high premium in order to see it thirty right. days after instead of four months after. Mm -hmm. And I'm just throwing out that number. For example, a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Which is high. Most people won't do that, but I think they're trying to find what the what the right level would be that that it's high enough to make it a special event, but affordable enough where enough people would do it. Yeah, right. And of and of course, like, let's say if it's in the next um, uh, James Cameron's movie, I mean, obviously, I'd buy it. I You'd buy care. it, but yeah, you see, and James, I would invite people and. But see, it's something like a James Cameron, on Steven Spielberg. I can't speak for for Cameron, but Spielberg recently, you know, he's very theatrical and. and right. He wouldn't want his film probably to play on VOD 30 days later. I, I'm just throwing examples of, right. of what, other, what people have talked about. How, how do you soften the windows while still making it lucrative? Because at the end of the day, it's mostly about the money. Mm -hmm. Some people, it's about the, the, the principle and the art, but it's mostly about the money. So if you could find a lucrative uh, intersection right. uh, where, where it would make sense to everybody, then you might see the window soften. On the other hand, I, I fully respect and, and support my my theatrical exhibitor friends and clients because they've invested a lot upgrading their systems from 35 millimeter prints to the digital right. and and enhancing their theaters and enhancing the experience. So they want to protect their flank. They want to protect their investment. That's fully understandable. Mm -hmm. um, but coming back to your other question of, of what the criteria are, we need to have a, a good script, committed talent. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're an independent producer saying, how do I get my film made? I mean, that's ideal if you can pull that off, but most independent producers are looking for financing, you know. So the question is, do you even have a script to begin with? Mm -hmm. Or are you looking for somebody to finance that script? Mm -hmm. The more you can take on as risk in the development process, the more leverage you have. Of course, like in any business. Like in any business, but I think especially you know, this one, but yeah, probably in any business. So if, if you have the money to hire a, a good or very good screenwriter to rewrite it and come with the, the best possible product, that will likely attract, and then you have to have access to the agency to attract the talent. Mm -hmm. And then it, once you have that, as I said, the financing, I think is the least of the problems. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Um, so you said something very interesting and I just, I mean, I know what you're talking about, but just for the sake of the audience, I wanted to dig deeper into that. And it was a very interesting phrase. You said there's plenty of money out there. Too much. Too much. And a lot of the times when I'm sitting across of someone and we're talking about how to finance films, it's, it's always, you know, um, the, the big question for a lot of the independent producers. So let's talk about that. When you say there's... Too much money, what do you mean exactly? Well, as I said, I think there's, there's, there have been different vehicles made available for financing incentives that allow people that really aren't in the film business to invest in movies. And whether the movie does well or not, I don't think it really matters at the end of the day. In fact, if a film loses money, it might benefit them from a tax basis. Mm -hmm. And it's perfectly legitimate in most cases. Some aren't, but um, that... It's sort of like a, a separate cookie jar that's filling up rapidly with cookies that normally wouldn't get baked under the traditional model. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not telling anybody that you don't deserve to make a movie, but in my experience, generally those films that don't have real risk at heart don't tend to find big audiences. 
Okay, talk to me about risk. Um, look, an independent producer, you know, the, 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 the two worlds of our business are the studios and the independent producer. If you're a producer and you can go to a studio and convince them that you have a great project, they might say, great, we'll hire you, we might give you an office, uh, an assistant, an overhead deal, maybe even a development deal. But if and when you make your film, we own it completely, and you're basically a salaried employee for us on that film, and maybe you have some back end, probably you don't, but we own the film. So you don't have much risk in there because the studio is taking on the risk. Right. And they're paying you to produce a film and deliver a finished good. Okay, that, that's fine. There are obviously some exceptional producers who have different deals, but that's generally the model. The independent producers, I think, take on substantially more risk because they don't have the fairy godmother of the studio saying, we'll cover your overhead. So, you know, the independent producer has got to figure out how to pay for his life while he's waiting for his movie to, to gestate and be born. Mm -hmm. That can be a long process. They're independent producers that have been trying to get their films made for years either because they need to rewrite the project or they had talent attached and it fell out or the director fell out. Timing is everything in this business, like in life. They had the financing, the financing fell out. So all these things need to coalesce at the same mm -hmm. time. I think there's a lot of risk in there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the way he finances his film, if he has the elements, he'll probably raise 50 to 60% through pre-sales to people like myself around the world. Maybe he has an equity investor of 20 or 30, and maybe he has soft money from subsidies because he's filming in a state or a country that will give him 20, 30% back. And grosso modo, that's how he gets his film financed. But then he owns the film. Mm -hmm. He's taken on great risk to get there, but then he owns the film. In addition, if he's working through a sales agent, that sales agent is selling all the territory mm -hmm. separately, mm -hmm. Spain, Latin America, Japan, Australia and those countries account separately to him, so he's seeing the benefits of each territory. When a studio takes the film, they take it for the world, and they would do something called this cross-collateralization, which means if they make money in Japan but lose in Germany, they offset the two mm -hmm. before the producer sees any participation. Well, between that and typical studio accounting, it can be a long time before you ever see anything in addition. If ever. It's completely different models, mm -hmm. completely different DNA. One is cozier and more comfortable, although it may have its own politics of studio world. One is really guerrilla uh, filmmaking, living by the seat of your pants, living and dying. Um, and it's the same thing for distributors, by the way, live and die by, by every film, you know. So um, it's a very different risk um, profile mm -hmm. involved in doing that. For these other films that have free tax money being thrown at them, I'm not sure what the risk is there, you know? It's like, hey, I got a bunch of money, I need to spend it somewhere, do you have a film we can make, you know? Maybe it's a great film, maybe it's not. I'm always wondered though, when I, for example, when I go to Sundance the last 25 years, I think I can count on two hands the number of really commercially viable films, meaning in my little world, mm -hmm. that I've seen there, you know? Um, I, I've often wondered, what the P&L on most of the movies that go to Sundance looked like three, four, five years later. I'm not including what we saw happen last year, but especially this year when Amazon comes in and pays 14 million, 14 million, 16 million for films, because that's a different equation, a different financial model, and obviously there, you know, whoever made those movies is, is going home in a limo, very happy. <laughs> but traditionally, up until recently, there are a lot of movies at Sundance, and maybe five or ten get picked up theatrically, maybe another ten or twenty do VOD deals. I'm wondering what happens to the other 170. And I don't think they see the light of day in America, and I definitely know they don't see the light of day internationally. So, I'm, I'm, again, I don't know... I, I, I don't know how you make a movie not knowing what needs to happen in order to survive. You're looking at and the person who does that. <laughs> who makes it, you know, how do you, yeah. how do you make your next movie? I mean, how do you create a sustainable business yeah. plan if you don't have a, 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 a better than not understanding of, of where the film is going to go? You, you have to, you have to. I mean, when I, when I said uh, you're looking at the person who does that, meaning you still, you know, when you were actually talking about all these risks, I was just sitting there like, oh yeah, you know, because like that's exactly what we do. But when I was making my um, my new my new feature film was coming out actually pretty soon, but when I was uh, making uh, the latest one, 
I had distributors attached from the start. Because, and you never know how much the movie will make. And how did that work? Did you have a sales agent selling it for you, or how did you? No, uh, my my theatrical distribution was in Kazakhstan. Right. That that movie was. So it's a Kazakh language, right? It was, yeah, specifically made for the for, for that territory, and um, um, the subject matter, um, the story was really, really interesting to that market. Right. Was this the the, the polyamory story? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when I went there way before I shot the film. I went there, I talked to major distributors, whom you know, by the way. I do? Yes. And um, we picked who we're going to work with. We got, uh, we got them attached straight away. Local production that's a little bit different, and right. by the way, increasingly and hugely important around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, consistently, when you go, I think, every territory, I'm familiar with Poland, I mean, every week, there's a Polish production coming out, which is extraordinary. That's, it's a very high pace mm -hmm. by any standard. And many of those times, that local production will do as much, if not more, than the biggest Hollywood blockbuster coming out. And you see this in Spain, you see this in Italy, you see this in Holland, you see this uh, really everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and, and it tends to attract a lot of local interest. So I'm, I'm not surprised, and that's very smart that you did that. Well, we have to survive. We're independent producers, right? And and, and I was uh, the, the way I, I I think about it and often talk about it is, if you come from a different country, like myself, for example, that automatically means that you kind of have that market available to you as well. Yes. So why not explode for your for well, for your benefit? Yeah, I guess the, for sure. I mean, absolutely. The question is. How do you get your film into other markets beyond your well, local? Well, that's web? that's a tough question because. Here's and the most thing. of these local films, with rare exception, don't travel. I mean, they're relying on their home markets or very close neighboring markets, mm -hmm. but but they're huge. It's local productions mm -hmm. to the point where the studios now have entire divisions dedicated to making local films mm -hmm. or making remakes in the local languages. I mean, it's it's a very. Um, it's cool to see how connected it all has mm -hmm. become. You, you know, um, if I were to make that film, if I knew. If I had that experience before, because the, the, the movies I worked on before, they were all in English language, they were all American productions and stuff like that. This one was the first one in foreign language, which is my native language. So if I were to do it again, I would only shoot it in English. And then I would dub it to the territory I right. want to release it to. Because, and I didn't realize it then, because it was my first learning experience, basically. Because if it's um, dubbed, it's completely appropriate for theatrical distribution in that territory. Right. Yeah. It, it doesn't work for every territory, but for many foreign, foreign markets, it actually does work. But here, domestically, you can't sell it if it's a foreign language film. It's tough. Even if you dub it after the fact in the English, it's... Dubbing doesn't work here. It, it's as big as American product is going internationally, it's very hard. Mm -hmm. And specific niche bringing it back the other way right right so th that that's basically what i would what, what i would recommend to the viewers is that if if you are in fact making a movie specifically for some market somewhere else outside of um north america or you know any english-speaking country for that matter uh, make it in english dub it for that territory right. and then sell it everywhere else and that's smart When's your new movie coming out? It's coming out uh, May 9th in Kazakhstan. And that one is in English? That one is partially in English. The, the, the reason why is because my Mongolian co-producers, they insisted they, that it's done in um, two languages. So it wasn't fully my production at all. But the two languages being Kazakh and Ka English or uh, Mongolian? Yeah, yeah, Kazakh and English. Have you been to Mongolia? Not yet, <laughs> but I will. I'm, I'm always, uh, I'd be very curious to know what the theatrical activities in Mongolia are. Very little. But that, that's what makes it interesting. I mean, I imagine at some point there would be an audience that would like the multiplex experience. Mm -hmm. I, I would think so. I, as far as I know, the, uh, the, the theater network is very small. Um, what, what, do you know what the population of Mongolia is? What is the population of Mongolia? About 6 million? Six yeah. The whole country? And what yeah. about 
And how much of it is concentrated in the two or three biggest cities? Probably most of it. Yeah. I'm not sure, actually, that's a good question. But I, I actually do know that uh, when we discussed with our producers the, the project before we shot it, we knew that we could not rely on, on the market in Mongolia. This is why we uh, actually attached two big stars from Kazakhstan and they flew to Mongolia and that's where it was shot. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Because we were like, okay, in, in order for us to have the hope to make the money back and make some profit, we, we have to find a bigger market. Kazakhstan is it's a bigger market. Right. Mm -hmm. I always um, liked looking at sort of overlooked areas to start distribution platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, originally, I started in Central America, which is mm -hmm. seven different countries, mm -hmm. sort of the lowest of the lowest on the totem pole of Latin America. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it was the cheapest entry point mm -hmm. and because it was such a pain to manage all seven countries that very few people were doing it. So 20 years later, we're still, 30 years later, we're still working in Central America in addition to Latin America. And then we went to Eastern Europe at a time where people thought you're crazy and it's dangerous and it's mm -hmm. overlooked, but it was kind of a backwater thing that mm -hmm. now it's become much more uh, sophisticated, of course. But I realized, and that too is multiple territories, I realized I follow this pattern of looking for countries that are overlooked, multiple territories, and people can't be bothered. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, recently we started, about five years ago, we went to Puerto Rico and started distributing theatrically most of the non-studios there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's been a lot of fun and from there using it as a platform into the Caribbean Basin which has a multitude of islands between the West Indies and BBI and the Dutch Antilles that are misunderstood and often overlooked as well. So mm -hmm. that seems to be my, my destiny, working with overlooked Ignored territories, yeah, which yeah, I'm perfectly yeah. happy. And I'm sitting here and thinking, what other overlooked territories are out there? Isn't well, it? Mongolia is one that, I mean, you know, I, I, in yeah. my world, I never hear that. Uh, I don't know if China lays claim to that when they buy, the, buy, buy a movie, uh, but I've, I've never come across somebody it. buying from Mongolia, so who knows? Mm -hmm. Maybe your next film, you'll, you'll, you'll open that market as uh, the face of Mongolia and <laughs> bring people to the movie theaters. Who knows, yeah. Uh, but the previous movie that we talked about actually uh, found its uh, market in Mongolia, but it went to uh, the, uh, the uh, television. So, I don't know. It's, it, I mean, that, it, it is an exposure, it is a little bit of money, and um, why not? Why not? There's, there's so many opportunities today. I mean, that's, in addition to money, there's so many distribution outlets today that... that mm -hmm. uh, I think it's an encouraging sign for for the industry and for, for young people coming into the business who, you know, thinking, what do I do? Mm -hmm. So do, are you trying to adapt this whole uh, to, to maybe thinking about new ways uh, in case theatrical is, you know, th theaters are going down or something like that? The, are you kind of like thinking about any? No. Um, theatrical attendance, I think the last few years, generally speaking, has actually increased yeah, year yeah, on year. Yeah. The difference is that the repartition of the revenues is completely different. So mm -hmm. fewer movies are making much more money. Mm -hmm. So if you're on the right side of the fence with the right movie, you make more money than ever. Mm -hmm. But what was a fertile middle ground, I think, has gradually disappeared. Mm -hmm. And the cost of making movies and marketing movies is bigger than ever, so the exposure is much bigger, which is why you have all these studios making these tentpole franchise movies that they can cross-platform against across different fields, not just movies, but it's TV series, merchandising, mm -hmm. theme parks, games. Mm -hmm. they, they want to monetize it as much as they can and amortize their, their, their IP sequels, you know. Right. Um, I wish and, they, they made less of those. <laughs> well, it's a little bit brain-numbing, especially the, yeah, the superhero. Oh, yeah. You know, if you close your eyes in the theater and you listen to six trailers, they all sound alike. With oh, exception. I'm gonna try that. <laughs> it, they all sound alike, and, and it's uh, like some of them are great. I mean, you know, and who, who am I? I mean, these people are tremendously professional. You know, Disney, I'm very close to, and it's extraordinary what they put together with with Marvel and Pixar and uh, Lucas and, and, and their own brand. I mean, so that they know what they're doing. But it's it's um, I think it's become much more corporate today. And the other really interesting 
phenomenon to pay attention to is the consolidation. I mean, yesterday Disney announced that they're closing on the Fox transaction on March 20th, that's in a week. I mean, that's digesting a whale. It's, it's right. gigantic. And, and the fact that that got through the antitrust is, is important because those two companies together will now control... 65, is it? 65. Percent of content in theaters? That sounds high, but it's going to be a considerable number. That's what I read. And I th it could well be. And, yeah. and in different territories, it could be even higher in terms of the, the, the overall box office mm -hmm. revenue. I think that is going to trigger further consolidation. I mean, AT&T already absorbed Warner Brothers, mm -hmm. Time Warner. That was a big one, too, uh, even though the government fought the, the, the antitrust issue on that. Um, so inevitably, who's left over? You have Sony, Paramount, mm -hmm. MGM. Um, Lionsgate, and then smaller independents. Mm -hmm. uh, How is it going to affect your business? I, I think positive or negative. I mean, the negative is that the more these big boys get together, um, there are going to be three, three or four last men standing, mm -hmm. last women standing. I mean, big behemoths that will just be massively powerful. Um, and we'll make probably that many more tentpole movies that'll just monopolize mm -hmm. the markets. But with that power, I think comes a certain rigidity. It's like the Titanic, it doesn't turn on a dime. And I think as an independent, whether it's an independent producer, distributor, if you're nimble enough, you can sort of run around those big boys and find niches of opportunity. But the question is, what are the opportunities? Because Netflix, at least on paper, financially, is as big or bigger than any one of those put together. Based on the number of subscribers, times what they're charging, the projected runway they still have in terms of viewers worldwide, mm -hmm. they have a long way to go still. And, and what they've done is incredible. Mm -hmm. They are carrying a lot of debt. But they could buy whatever they want, whenever they want, and outbid anybody, and that would be the end of the story. Mm -hmm. Because they have a way of monetizing that the studios don't. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to disclose how they monetize it. So, ideally, you create some kind of alliance with one of these, being a, a pro content provider, mm -hmm. um, being a sub-distributor somehow for one of them. Mm -hmm. it, it, I'm not telling you it's easy to figure out, because the world is changing very, very, very rapidly. But I but don't think theaters will disappear anytime soon. There's I don't, I agree with you completely. Culturally yeah. and financially there's been too much of an investment there mm -hmm. and the people that run theaters, again I'm thinking of my oldest client and dear friend Mookie Greidinger, are among the smartest people I know. They have a lot of support from the studios and a lot of people, important people, believe that movies should be seen first in theaters and everything else comes later but much later. But also what, what's important is that the public actually loves that experience like they do like, yeah they really do and um i i don't go back to kazakhstan often not, not not as often as i want to but when i do i i, I can tell you it's also over there it's, it's the same thing it's it's a it's become a culture movie going has become a culture on its own and i'm glad it survived because when i broke into the business 34 years ago there really was only theatrical. Video didn't exist, DVD didn't exist, TV was in its infancy mm -hmm. overseas. So, I mean, those were the glory days because mm -hmm. anything you had had to play theatrically. And the theaters were huge halls of a thousand people. They weren't these little multiplexes. Mm -hmm. Completely different. But through all of the trends over the last 30 years, theaters have survived. I remember when video came on the scene 25 years ago, 30 years, whatever. It exploded. It was so big. I mean, the number of films being made just for video with Charles Bronson and Chuck Norris, you know, and the horror things, it, it was huge. And people would make films for nothing and they would, huge multiples, you know. Mm -hmm. But theaters still had their place if you had the right movie. Mm -hmm. And DVD exploded. And that started to disappear. The VOD well, came of age, you know. Mm -hmm. Somehow theater still like, survives. You know, if you give the audience the right experience, I think theaters mm -hmm. will continue to survive. Um, yeah, but at the end of the day, change is the only thing that's constant, right? It's the only thing that's constant. Um, and and this, this business has changed so very much, I mean... Uh, 
So, if you were to <coughs> talk to someone uh, who wants to be a distributor, what would what would what would you say? What what does it take? A distributor in a certain country? Anywhere, yeah. Yeah. Like, and you know, because of the nature of our company, uh, clearly we're being listened to by a lot of foreign people, also. But hopefully, as Americans listening to us too. So. Doesn't matter which country, but like, what would you do? What? You know, overseas. Um, I don't think I could be wrong, but in my experience there have not been as many new companies coming in as distributors as maybe there have been new producers. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because there's a finite amount of content which is really valuable. Mm -hmm. And the distributors that have already been existing and on the ground have bent over backwards to make sure that they've secured that content mm -hmm. and will do anything they can to preserve those relationships. So if you're a new distributor breaking in today, what do you do? I would try to bring the local production edge, mm -hmm. which means you'd have to be involved or connected to local production, mm -hmm. because often the theaters will pay better terms for local production because of quotas, the televisions will as well. Some countries actually have quotas where you need to have a certain amount of local product. Mm -hmm. So I think if you had that, that would be one advantage. And then somehow you'd have to try to familiarize self, yourself with the markets. And there are about, you know, there are a couple hundred sales agents, maybe 20 that are really controlling the top product and try to establish inroads, but knowing that you're gonna have very tough competition because of the existing uh, distributors. I can think of one company in the last few years, which is a company out of uh, the Benelux that came out of left field maybe four or five years ago with no prior experience and actually successfully built inroads into the business mm -hmm. and managed to secure uh, an output deal with STX, which is one of the leading mini majors here. They just released the upside a couple of months ago. Um, and that was no small accomplishment in a, in a, in a market that I'd call very developed and sophisticated. Um, they also happen to have extraordinary taste and they're of a new generation that see things differently. And uh, they're very good friends of mine. Their company's called The Searchers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I think they've done it really right. But I can't think of too many newcos mm -hmm. that have come in um, successfully as distributors. One tendency would be to overpay to get product, you know, mm -hmm. and that's showing not a good long term strategy. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to be very well financed, tap into local production, and work very hard to establish relationships with a couple of the leading content providers. Mm -hmm. And obviously ahead of time, analyze your market to see if there's an opportunity there. Uh, it, it could well be that there's an opportunity or maybe somebody, oh, buy an existing business. It should have the benefit of having a library. Right. Um, that would be a good way to step in. Mm -hmm. What about um, producers? Becoming a producer? Mm -hmm. I think that's a more open field because there you're talking about, it's really how good is your access to content? Mm -hmm. How good is your taste? How connected are you to the zeitgeist of what's going on today? What people might want to see not only today, but a year from now? You know, how old are you? What's your demo? You know, what, what, Jason Blum did just brilliantly, you know, tapped into that low-budget horror uh, space, but giving it something that elevated above mm -hmm. the norm. Mm -hmm. I mean, brilliant what he's done mm -hmm. at every level, <clears throat> and then branched out from there. Being a producer is, how, you know, to what extent are you betting on yourself? Right. If you have finance, financing, great. Um, if you have access to talent or personal connections, great. I would certainly try to work on some productions mm -hmm. rather than just say I'm starting to really know what it's about because producing today can mean so many things. You know, are you the one that brought the actor in? Are you the one that paid for the article that you optioned? Mm -hmm. uh, are you the one that was physically on the set? Are you the one that um, brought in last minute financing? Are you the one that brought in the USD? I mean, what does producing really, really mean? Um, but I think it would be important for a producer to know from beginning to end what it really means to develop something out of nothing, 
to assemble the package, to get it financed, to oversee its production, and on the back side, oversee the editing, the post-production process, right through delivery. I mean, it, it's such a food chain. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I have a funny story. People say, why don't you produce all your connections? And I say, because where I live, there's only 24 hours in a day, and I'm running three companies, and to do things right, you can only, you don't, you don't want to spread yourself too thin. The one time I produced a film, and I was actually the executive producer, but I did provide the financing, was 1988, so we're going back 30 years. Video was still booming. <clears throat> and I was working for a distribution, uh, international sales company. Mm -hmm. So I kind of did this on the side, and it was uh, a film called Brothers in Arms, which was a direct, uh, let's say, inspiration uh, by Deliverance, which was a classic movie of four guys that go hunting in the mountains and get attacked by these rednecks. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought that was a pretty saleable concept even today. And we shot it in Big Bear in the middle of winter. Mm -hmm. And my two producers came to me and said, do you want a completion bond? And I said, what is that? <laughs> and they said, well, if you go over budget, it's like an insurance, yeah. you know, if you go over budget, they'll cover you. And I go, the budget's 400000 I mean, how are we going to go over budget? That's an enormous amount of money. <laughs> why, why spend the extra 24000 or whatever? In the middle of winter, which is not a smart time to shoot anyway, yeah. the entire crew went on strike for some union thing. <laughs> our lead actor got a hypothermia and had to be hospitalized for three days. To make a long story short, our budget doubled from 4000 to 800000 And that's when I understood what a completion bond was about <laughs> and why I should have taken it. But the really funny part of the story is that the two producers were these two dear friends of mine. Mm -hmm called Mark Gordon and Chris Melodandri. There you go. <laughs> Mark Gordon has been one of the most successful producers both on the film and television front and recently sold his company to E1 very successfully last year. Chris Melodandri was the brain behind Illumination and he has transformed Universal and I couldn't be prouder to see what both of them have done mm -hmm. and uh, to have a poster I think from the Moroccan distributor that says Brothers in Arms, yeah. seeing their names and my name that could produce. This um, is actually a really cool, inspiring story because uh, everyone who actually has become successful will have to go through something like this. Well, and by the way, Chris and Mark were partners back then mm -hmm. for a long time and they were Mavericks. Um, I think they did independent films, they did studio films, so they really paid their dues and they really what I was talking about earlier, knowing the process from A to Z, they, they, I think they have different skill sets, but fundamentally they understood the entire process. Mm -hmm. And I think Mark remained more independent producer, even though he did a lot of studio films, mm -hmm. whereas Chris eventually ended up at Fox, I believe, and was running um, their animation division, Blue, I forget, Blue Ridge or something. Um, they did Ice Age, and, and he learned a lot about animation. It was quite... It was through that, I don't think he had any particular passion for animation, but it was through that mm -hmm. that he backdoored into creating what Illumination is today. But they certainly put in their dues, tremendous work ethics, and um, two wonderful, wonderful guys. And it, it's nice not only to see that good things happen to good people, but uh, that they've remained, I think, very grounded and humble and um, not carried away by everything Hollywood can be. You know, some of the best, uh, some of the really, really successful people uh, that I've met who are behind camera for some reason, they, they are actually super humble. You know, they're, they're amazing to communicate with. Open. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. They, they probably watched a lot of embarrassing episodes in front of the camera. So being behind the camera, they Maybe probably realize uh, yeah. there's a different way to be. Yeah. It's interesting, and it's it, it's always good to hear another example <coughs> of the same. Yeah, but I, I think producers have a bigger runway in general. Mm -hmm. um, again, producing can mean a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So, what makes Andrea Andrea? What what out of your character? What are the most important character? Uh, mm, traits that you have that make you, you, successful, very, very funny. I feel like I'm on a job interview. <laughs> no, but like, 
I, you know, I think it's very interesting. Look, I think I think one thing that um, one one thing that led me towards this side of the business um, would be the international background and and languages. I was born in Cuba. I grew up in Switzerland. Um, and with that came exposure to various languages and cultures, and I think that's not essential, but it's immensely helpful when you're dealing with 10 different time zones every day and clients all over the world and the ability to communicate with many of them on their terms and their language and, and not just do business, but really communicate, create mm -hmm. friendships. I think that's a very distinct competitive advantage, and, and I don't speak any Eastern European languages, I mean, I married. Well, you do a little bit of Russian. I, I married a beautiful Russian lady, so I'm up to 57 words after 12 <laughs> years, which I'm very proud of. Um, but but uh, the, when, when I say that, the point I'm making is that you can create business even if you don't speak the local language, obviously, because everybody, English is the lingua franca, pretty mm -hmm. much. But I think international background and exposure has been tremendously helpful. And I think, as I said earlier, I just had this. Um, insatiable itch from a very early age to be on my own um, and not I don't think I'm a corporate animal at heart mm -hmm. and the film business is nothing if not an animal that lends itself to this beautiful marriage of commerce and creativity mm -hmm. And it's a meritocracy, so if you have a great idea, you can really run with that idea here, whether it's a tech company or whether it's an idea for a script. So you have all these wonderful creative opportunities, but at the end of the day, show business is business, because if there's no business, there's no show. Mm -hmm. So it's got to work at that level, too. So to be able to blend those together <clears throat> was tremendously, tremendously satisfying mm -hmm. for me. Um, and I think... The film business, um, which doesn't have clearly defined <coughs> boundaries, I meaning it's not a nine to five job, it's mm -hmm. more like a 24 7, yeah. seven day a week job. It, yeah. it, it becomes passionate mm -hmm. in, in many ways. Afforded me the opportunity to really go as far as I wanted to take it. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people, many people, that have gone much, much farther in my sector. I mean, some fantastic luminaries who I'm happy to talk about. But for me, it really gave me an opportunity to prove myself um, on my own terms. Um, and, that, and that was very deeply satisfying to me. Um, work ethic is really a, a very important thing for me. And, uh, and I think being able to bring a certain discipline to this business, but also have fun with it, you know, it's been a, a really great thing. I was talking to some of my close friends who have. I'm very proud of, you know, not only Chris and Mark, who I mentioned, but the other day I was with uh, Graham King, who won the Oscar for The Departed, who yeah. produced Gangs of New York, who yeah. produced Traffic, and most recently Bohemian Rhapsody. And, oh uh, my God, I didn't know he was also part he, of that. I think that one at the Globes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And at the Oscars, which I attended for the first time in 35 years, people thought he had a good chance to win there as well. Uh, it didn't, but that film, I think, is going to go on to do... Well, lead actor one. One, right? But a lot of people thought it might. But yeah. So this is interesting, and it's 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 just informational, nothing more. But Green Book won Best Picture, and I like the film a lot. It's going to do, I think, fifty million domestically, give or take ten million. Mm -hmm. Not a bad day at the office at all. A Star Is Born, which I loved, is going to do. 200 million domestic and probably the same overseas, so 400 million. Theatrical box office I'm mm -hmm. talking about. Bohemian Rhapsody, I think, did 225 domestically, but it's going to do 600 overseas. Yeah. So it's going to do twice as much as Star is Born worldwide. Right. Um, I'm not sure what the budgets were. Probably Bohemian may have been more, but the, you know the, that film is... And that's why people get in this business, because mm -hmm. if you touch a chord... And that word of mouth goes viral. There's nothing like it in the world. Yeah, it's, it's a freight train you can't stop. I mentioned earlier that we had acquired Slumdog Millionaire, and this was one of my greatest uh, achievements and one of my greatest mistakes. And the achievement was really due to my partner's wife mm -hmm. and my, another one of my partner's colleagues, both women who read the script and adored it. On, on, on script level, it was less than obvious that this film would be what it was. 
-hmm. You really had to imagine mm -hmm. what it could be, but it wasn't obvious. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That happens a lot. And that's kind of, if there's any art in our business, that's where that flavor comes in. Can you see where this could be with the right people around it? But we bought it on pre-buy. And it wasn't inexpensive, so we were kind of like holding our breath. So cut to two years later, the film is ready, and I go to the Toronto Film Festival where it premiered. And I stayed in the Roy Thompson Hall for the premiere. And the movie starts, and within 10 minutes, I'm pinching myself going, there's just something here that feels very special. Mm -hmm. And half an hour in, I'm going, oh my God, can they sustain this? By the end of it, I go, they pulled it off. And it gets like a 20 minute standing ovation. And I just had that feeling, I got, I still get goosebumps. So I said, I'm I, I know this film is going to win Best Picture. Yeah. And I know it's going to do Blockbuster. And I immediately called the sales agent, which is Pathé, the French company. And I said, what open territories do you have? They're an English French company. And they said, well, as a matter of fact, Spain and Latin America are still unsold, unbelievably. And I called my partner, Marius, and I said, look, <clears throat> we know usually don't go outside of our territory, but I'm just telling you, in my bones, I'm telling you that we should buy these territories and we'll figure out the distribution. Because if you have something good, everybody wants it. Of course. And we started to go down the road of negotiating both territories. And at the last moment, I got cold feet thinking, it's a lot of money, we don't really know people. I mean, I know people in those territories, but it's like, you know, it, 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 it's just so easy to talk. When you're in the moment, you feel it, and that's your voice, that deep instinct. And then conscience And then starts. your rationale gets yeah. in the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. We probably left, you know, three million on the table by not buying those two films, mm -hmm. by not buying that film for those two territories. I'm thrilled with what we had, Yeah. but it was a good lesson that... If, if you have a blockbuster in one territory, chances can be a blockbuster in every territory. Uh -huh. And I'll never forget that. The, other, the only other time I ever felt that was when I saw Dances with Wolves at the premiere. Mm -hmm. It was in Italy, at what used to be Mifed, which was a film market that has since disappeared. And I remember seeing the film, and today it's, to date it's still one of my favorite films. And I, I ran out of the room and I called my stockbroker and I said, buy Orion as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Orion was a distributor of their public company. Mm -hmm. I just knew this film was going to be best picture mm -hmm. and it was going to lift the company's fortunes, which it did. Um, we weren't distributing that, <clears throat> but at least we got some of the benefits through, uh, through the public company. But I'm very proud of Graham and uh, Graham King, who I've known since day one. And, and he's been a maverick and a pioneer and took massive risks. He made gangs of New York. People thought he was out of his mind. and, and, and he proved everybody wrong, and he more than anybody believes in. And I think it took him ten years to get uh, Bohemian Rhapsody made. You know? Oh my God, I love that movie. So you talk about stamina yeah. and believing in what you stand for. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there are a lot of great stories of, of independents who have. Uh, Glenn Basner, who runs Film Nation, has built a Colossus. Mm -hmm. My good friend Joe Drake, who's CEO of Lionsgate, uh, he's had an incredible story. Patrick Waxberger. Uh, he used to run Lionsgate and is about to announce his return. Uh, but there, there are quite a few prominent independents who have really uh, made our small part of the film business very prominent. Mm -hmm. And we owe them a lot of gratitude. You know what I feel like? I feel like I want to be your shadow. <laughs> you just want to walk around, listen to what you do, see the people that you work with, Learn. I'd love you to be my shadow because my, my little boy would think I'm a lot prettier then and a lot younger. <laughs> so it's a deal. <laughs> no, but because it's so inspiring to hear what you're talking about. It, it's interesting. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, that's the other thing. It's never been a dull moment. You're dealing with 10, 20, 30 different countries, 10, 15, 20 different films a year. Every film is different. Mm -hmm. I mean, the systems you work through are the same, but every film is different. Mm -hmm. Every time you go to release a film, it's different because you don't know what's going on in the world at that moment that could help you or complicate your life. So it's, it's you, 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 you can't really get in a rut. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to stay f agile and flexible in, in your perspective of things. Mm -hmm. um, but I generally, I think I, I remain... I have to remain, maybe it's self-delusional, but I have to remain an optimist because there is so much opportunity. Very funny. Oh my God. 
You guys don't know that. But Andre cannot, cannot not joke. <laughs> I think it's a self-defense. You, you have to laugh. You have to laugh because otherwise... Uh, yeah. Uh, and, it, it, our business is still a little bit the Wild West, so, so it, it allows for a lot of fun times. Yeah, you, when I was talking about your personality traits, I see, especially now after we have this chat, because usually we just like laugh and crack jokes, and, and then I go off hanging with Lana. <laughs> but um, what I see right now is someone who is very, very interested in everything that's going on around. You are genuinely interested in people, processes, plus you love challenge. This whole pro problem solving thing, it's really working in that head. Every day is a challenge in the business. I mean, you, yeah. you, you um, and, and, and the way, especially the way we're structured where I, I, I'm CEO and messenger boy and everything in between, mm -hmm. strategic planning, acquisitions, contracts, I mean, the one area I'm not well versed in is deliveries and, and materials because that's a very technical yeah, area. Yeah. But fortunately, we have well, a, a lovely, uh, yeah. lovely colleague Tamar that does that, and I'm, I'm really blessed with 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 three fantastic ladies who've been with me forever, Layla, Liza, and Tamar. Um, but you know, I, I think that there is a sounding corny that you know, the biggest personality trait or what motivates me is really my family. You know, my wife. Yes. Uh, Sveta and, and my daughter Anastasia, who's soon 21, and my little boy Maxine, that are two. Uh, because everything I do, I really do with uh, their legacy in mind. Mm -hmm. um, well, Sveta is Lana as well, because I keep saying Lana and then we say Sveta. Sveta, Svetlana. Lana. Yeah, yeah. Well, you have a beautiful family and you have an amazing life. Very inspiring conversation. Thank you so much. I mean, I think it's so awesome that you instigate this, and uh, it's a credit to you and, and what you attract. And uh, I, I'd love to continue the conversation oh, yeah, on definitely. or off camera. <laughs> and uh, so, seriously, I think it's, I'm not kidding when I say this. I, I started this whole talk by telling you that I was, I was a journalist coming out of right. college. And when I say journalist, interviews were what I specialized in. I mean, I, I find that format so engaging and so compelling. I love it. And to get to know somebody um, in that format, I think, is, 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 is fantastic. I mean, the, if I had to redo my career, I mean, I would love to have been uh, somebody like a Charlie Rose without the sexual allegations attached. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I that, that kind of intimacy, that directness, right. is, is, is priceless. You know, what they do in 60 minutes, it's... Mm -hmm. it's Great opportunity, so I salute you. I hope you keep doing that. And uh, when when uh, I see you in sixty minutes or something, you know, <laughs> I hope you'll remember the little folks that made it all possible. Oh, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I truly, truly enjoyed it. It's a great pleasure. I hope one day I can I can find out more about your films and if I can be of, of help uh, through our overlapping interests in that part of the world. Of course, yeah, definitely. Please count on it. I think when you should redo a remake of the polyamory story, do it in Utah. <laughs> because I think you'd find financing, it's very popular there. And there you could do it in English. But we have to change the story. <laughs> Anyways, on that note. Spasiba Bolshoi, thank you so much. And uh, really appreciate it. Thank you to you.